again discuss war, borders, and physical removal. This time, part two. Tim. So, the last episode, we discussed the incoherence part and how everyone basically left Nick Gillespie has a kind of emotive incoherence with respect to borders here. Today, I want to sort of move on to sort of what an ideal system would look like or what a better system would look like um, or, or a right libertarian system would look like. Um, all those words could be interchangeable, but I think you could pick them. First of all, I'm going to bring up the point about physical removal. None of this makes sense. Um, now, again, this sort of gets into the sort of the semantics or the sort of oxymoronic part of sort of political philosophy here is none of if you if you assume there's conflict, OK, if you assume there's conflict now you could say, well, an ideal society would have no conflict. But if you assume there's conflict, there's going to need to be some sort of police force or or private militia or secret uh, Stasi or some organization to enforce borders or to enforce the people to stop erecting borders. So you're going to need one or the other. If, if people start erecting borders, you're going to need a group to say, no, you can't actually block this neighborhood off or this city off. Or you're going to need or if you want to do it, you're going to need some sort of group to do it. So in a way, everyone supports physical removal, except maybe some sort of pure platonic view that would hold the view. And, you know, Foucault pressed Chomsky on this, you know, the idea that an ideal society would have no conflict or no, you know, this is the point that Thad Russell likes to bring up, too, that it would have no renegades or unregistered people here. Everything would just be, you know. It would be sort of like the Garden of Eden in a way. There wouldn't be any disagreement. So why would you need borders, or why would you, why would be people even want to erect borders? So I said I said two things like so like if I want to stop people from coming in, there were some there's there been some people who like you know in, interestingly in places like New York it's in, in in Australia it's actually a crime to defend yourself from somebody. Um 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 and actually a crime to defend if, if if I would sort of start a militia and sort of let's go defend. Charleston Harbor or let's go to send the, you know, build a b wall around the U.S. or something like that. That would actually sort of be a crime in a way. Um, um, now, you could try to do it all in libertarian ways, but, you know, this, this becomes sort of problematic here. So, so all societies in a way need a point. We've done an episode on police force. We've interviewed Keith Preston on police, too. We've interviewed on Thomas Hobbes as well. Um, so if you, you want to construct a sort of Thomas Paynean global liberal society, you're going to need some class or some organization to keep it that way. Unless of course if you adopt this pure view. So everyone in a way either believes in some kind of borders or the lack there of borders. And the only way to maintain that in, in some reasonable society is to have them. So th that that's the first point. I don't want to hammer that point any more on, but I think I think it has to be stated, you know, stating the obvious here. But once we state the obvious here, we're going to try to move towards a more coherent theory here. Um, we're both sort of right libertarians here, hoppy and variety here. We both believe in property rights here of some kind. Again, the left would always, of course, quickly bemoan on the points that blah blah blah. The the, the property rights are 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 illegitimate, you know, for a laundry list of reasons. My quick retort would say, well, that they're they're terrible for everyone. They're terrible for the Chinese, North Koreans, the Russians, and the Africans too. It's not just a British or American problem, you know. And I brought this up again to Walter Block. It's sort of like, you know, if the Aztecs stole it from the Incas or some other group, then we get into a rabbit hole problem. So why not just accept the existing ones? Now these truly existing ones might favor certain groups, but they also might disfavor certain groups as well. Um, um, but I don't see a group. I don't see a benevolent one world uh, manager to, to, to dole out correct titles. And they don't really have a standard defined correct titles. Again, you can make fun of the libertarian homesteading idea all you want. But I think the libertarian homestead idea is at least a theory, at least a theory. Now, again, there are there are problems with it, um, at least in in practice. But I, I don't. I don't, I don't see, I, you know, now you could say, well, individuals don't do it, communities do it. Well, then we'll just say communities do it. Well, then community ownership um, has some problems too here. 
of course, everyone to the left of Nick Gillespie has a sort of dodgy relationship to, you know, familial obligations, we'll say, or familial tribal obligations, unless they're non-white, then they're more okay with it. But even that, with the example of Christopher Hitchens here, they, you know, they actually don't like, they actually hate the Taliban more. Um, 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 so, so, you know, if you want to argue that a sort of group owns a sort of region or territory, be they the Taliban, be they the Dakotians, be they some sort of like pagan Norse group, um, and they're fighting against some other organized, you know, civilization, agrarian, you know, uh, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe hunter gatherers are sort of less, and this is sort of category C and D here. I brought up in the first episode, I sort of divided up groups going out, groups going in, and their destination here. So maybe C and D, uh, you know, we don't really have a theory. This is sort of like a, I think it's Huntington's, you know, clash of civilizations here. Um, there's no real rule book when, you know, a really developed society meets a less developed society here. Uh, 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 there's no real rule book. Um, and I don't see a rule book either. And as many people point out, the, you know, and McIntyre would agree with this as well, was that the left in power operates like just like Andrew Jackson to the you know, ethnic peoples of Europe. Um, 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 they don't, they, in some ways they operate worse um, or, or, or at least similar. Um, so, you know, now again, you can always bring up the no true Scotsman fallacy and say, well, you know, Lenin was actually, a right, Lenin and Stalin were actually right-wing phenomena. But then this gets silly. Then why are you calling yourselves tankies? And why is Ben Burgess wanting to go full Stalin? Why is, so, so then you, you know, th- then we get into the, the, this sort of, you know, rabbit hole of semantics which again is a semantic point in a sense but i think there is a real dispute out there um and uh, i i sort of in this episode discussion i should like to explore what that dispute would look like so first with them do you agree with my point about physical movement for so all the hans Hoppe gets attacked for it it seems like everyone agrees with it including the universalists unless the universals of course have this sort of platonic utopian view Swithin, do you agree with that? And then what do you make of the other comments? What would be more towards a better system? Swithin? Um, the... Sorry, Tim, can you just repeat the question? I've lost my train of thought. Does everyone agree? Um, do you agree that everyone has, for all Hoppe gets attacked for uh, his physical removal, mean advocating aggression, that seems to be an issue of aggression in itself. Um, it's not like a characterological attack on Hans Hoppe and right libertarians. Everyone seems to agree that that e- if you have an international system, you need to prevent people from setting up borders within the international system. So even even the internationalists have to have a physical removal squad. Um, um, oh, yeah, I, 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 entirely, I entirely agree with that, um, that. There are borders and you can't set up your borders in there. And if you do that, we're going to have to sort of remove you. But I suppose the only difference is with the Hoppian one is Hoppian basically is advocating some form of exile that you remove from a particular community. Whereas if you do something which is against the state of setting up your own borders within the particular area, they might just imprison you. And uh, now you could say, well, that's not physical removal because you're still within the sort of the uh, territorial area of that state. But I mean, effectively, you've been physically removed from normal society. So you've at least got that sort of recognition of um, removal. Um, as you point out, I mean, really, removal uh, as such is just a, a, a response to um, to forms of sort of well, what people might consider crime in certain sense. Uh, the question is whether the crime committed that justify physical removal can be merely a contractual um, one. Hopper's implication is in the covenant community, you sign the contract and then you violate it. So it's a contractual reason. And you, you've kind of pre-agreed, as it were, to be booted out if you break it. Or rather, you just so happen to be within a particular bordered area and uh, you're essentially uh, forced into that legal code rather than uh, being um, ag- agreeing to it. So it's um, it's quite so. Yeah, uh, you're always going to need some sort of um, 
punishment or some description. You're going to have some physical removal. Uh, it, it's just, you know, Hoppers is just a, a particular version of it done for reasons that the left don't like, rather than them being in principle against it. Um, I, want, although, Swinton, yeah. I want to add, this is, this is a pedantic point here, but if you, if you adopt the universalist position, there really is no place to exile someone. Um, this, is, this is one of the things I've thought about before. If you adopt, if the U.S., if, if the borders of the liberal, if the liberal has no borders, um, there's no way to exile somebody. You basically have to re-educate them or kill them. Um, well, um, well, that's why you exile them to, um, you know, a work camp. Or, you know, a, a prison where they can be re-educated away from the rest of society. So you kind of make a the cultural difference between the, the enlightened liberals who can live with everybody else in community. And then uh, you need sort of uh, the reactionary liberals to enforce the liberal ideology on the people in the work camps or the prisons. Um, that that would seem to be the way they would. That, I think that'd be a, a fair characterization, I think, of that universal position. Do you think that accurate? Oh yeah, that would that would be that would be a very fair characterization. I would just argue that in theory that that isn't liberal here. Um, that's not particularly liberal. That's not particularly nice sounding either. Which again is fine in a sense, but it takes a lot of the Mickey and the heat that gets thrown at Hoppe. Away from. We can see this with the sort of vaccine mandates. You should take the vaccine because it's good for you. But if you don't, we're just gonna, you know, basically, y- you can't go anywhere. Basically, uh, I mean, and in some societies that will be more or less you can't leave your house. Uh, again, if I said this six years ago, people like Jeffrey Tucker would laugh. But to Jeffrey Tucker's credit, he's he's been like, well, um, it's it's actually. You know, this is actually tyrannical here. But Noam Chomsky, of course, thinks societies should allow to do this. Um, um, you know, they, they have to be, you know. Uh, of course, Chomsky brought up you have to enforce it, of course. Um, but, you know, the reactionary liberals have no trouble enforcing it. But th- that's not liberalism here. Um, but that, that's my point about physical removal. Everyone, in a way, agrees with it, um, or at least some boundaries of some sort for some reasons here. And we've seen that. We've seen that. I'm, I, I, didn't, I didn't create the coronavirus crisis to make them look like hypocrites. I would prefer it never happened. I want to say that. Um, but unfortunately, it did happen. Um, so we're now living in this, in this, in this current iteration of the world here. Um, 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 so that's what that's what we start here. Nothing makes none of this makes sense, which just relates to power in a way. But more idealistically. What do you make of home setting here? Or what do you make of group home setting? Or saying like some, you know, larger group says, well, this is our territory. We don't want anyone else to come in here and we want it should be left alone. I would say that's legitimate here. The problem is, um, and this is Keith Preston, Todd Lewis, and someone else had an interview with an environmentalist here. Um, I forget, Derek Jensen. Derek Jensen made a great point here. He said, what if a valuable resource is under that land? OK, uh, but what if the indigenous group says, well, this is our ancestors burial grounds or whatever. Now we have a conflict here. So um, the the sort of liberal capitalists say, we'll just pay them. But they say, no, we don't want to take money. We want to keep it here. So now we have a conflict. It's sort of an intractable conflict here. Uh, this, this is sort of the intersection of economics or sociology and political philosophy here, um, here, right here. Um, w- only one group can be a winner. It's not a, it's a zero sum game in a sense. Only one group can be a winner, one group can lose. I don't see it, any clear answer to this question here. This is very much the settlement of various areas here uh, in North America here. I mean, the land for farming was much more um, useful as farming land, probably. And again, much to the chagrin of progressive Christians, there is there is in the Bible, which most of these people were, uh, there is a sort of sow the earth and you make it productive here. Uh, you know, put the earth under your yoke here. So there, there was a sort of religious motivation too. But when you have sort of competing claims, um, you don't really have a you know you don't really have a 
really have a great a group. So a lot of border conflicts look like this. Um, I mean, this this in a way to go back to Glenn Greenwald is the leave Afghans, the Afghanistans. Well, if the Afghans are going to run it like that and we don't like them and they occasionally, you know, have terrorists in the West. Now, you can go full Alex Jones and say that we attacked ourselves. Um, but if you just accept the official narrative, um, it, it becomes a lot more dodgier here. I mean, this was very much the case with in the United States here, I mean, for much the left likes to bring up the sort of settlement here, you know, you'd have Indians attack white settlers, railroads or whatever. They could argue the railroad shouldn't have been there, but then this is a much more pesky, much more peskier issue here. So how would you resolve that conflict here? It's a very intractable conflict here. And what insights do you think right libertarianism has and, and, and so forth? So with him, well, the homesteading question is interesting. Um, I mean, obviously, on the individual level, you know, homesteading is kind of makes sense. I mean, you have a resource which is unused and then it's used and then whatever use it first is theirs because, well, who else has a better claim to it? Um, well, that, that, that kind of makes sense. Um, although then if you move away from sort of the strict um, lockinism of mixing labour and land and go some more use to a large extent, you can then get, of course, the um, the dispute that you outlined uh, with the the natives and the ancestors. Uh, supposing that the that it was a a sacred ground which the the native Indians used. The question then arises: You know, if there's a resource under there that you want to take, uh, you know, what constitutes sort of interfering with the use or the ownership of that? I mean, if it's the case that the the mining company can kind of like dig down like a mile away and then sort of dig under the ground and go, you know, is 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 that okay? Um, well, that's not obvious um, because you sort of want to sort of circumscribe, you know, what was the actual use that the natives were using it for, and you know whether or not that had been interfered with. Um, when it comes to um, group ownership of like a particular area, um, I can kind of see that as a as an as an idea. Um, but the ownership is kind of odd because if you take like a right libertarian position, they, they, they that wouldn't necessarily lay claim to that society then being as a collective telling everybody else what they should be able to do in that um, area. Um, it's more of a case of, well, if you make that claim, it's more just like an in-out distinction. You're either within the community or you're sort of at, outside it or, 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 or something along those lines. Um, so I don't think that group ownership is necessarily the best way of looking at it, resolving conflict. I think rather, as I mentioned in the previous episode, um, the idea that you're going to have you're going to have to have areas with a common law. Uh, to, to deal with disputes between certain people, whatever those disputes are, and because there'll be ones where people can't be reconciled and there'll be need to be some form of um, arbitration. Um, you're going to need a mechanism to deal with um, those disputes and people are going to be are going to be beholden to certain laws, even if they don't necessarily want to be, at least not directly, because you you need that sort of common code over uh, a particular uh, groups because it makes group cohesion work. It makes society function, etc. Um, so I think the right libertarian approach really here is um, is is one of competitive dictatorship, to use uh, David Friedman's terms. Rather than to say you have group ownership, we go, well, we recognize that having a body that determines what the law is within a particular people group Let's just put it on a territorial basis for pragmatic purposes. Well, it's not just pragmatic. People who live close to each other are the ones who are most likely to get into dispute with each other. And so, you know, it kind of makes sense that, uh, you know, you have a law that pertains at least within a particular geographical area. And then it also has the advantage that, well, you can choose which community you want to live in. Now, obviously, the community you could then say, well, you can't because if the community can not let you in, then you can't choose to go there. Well, that's true. But at least um, there's lots of different ones you could potentially go to. And unless you're like really bad and like an unpleasant individual, the probability that one of them will take you in 
you know, is, is, is probably, you know, reasonably high. And so you have the situation where each of the communities are going to be in sort of competition with each other because they don't all want to lose their inhabitants. Even with that taxation, uh, it would just bring sort of shame on the community that everyone decided to go and move elsewhere because, well, uh, the sort of governing body, as it were, within that uh, area would be like, oh, well, we're clearly not very good because you know, people want to leave. I mean, this is a related point to that. Uh, David Friedman um, argument, the best way to judge, um, what's the the best way to judge sort of standards of living was immigration and emigration. If people left your country, it's a bad place to live. If people want to come and live in your country, it's a good place. Um, that was basically his claim, uh, which I thought was a, an interesting uh, way. So I would say the right libertarian view of this is really one of, um, is best understood as competitive dictatorship in sort of law provision as opposed to collective ownership, although you could say it's a quality form of that. But I wouldn't frame it in the claim of ownership because then it would imply that the uh, sort of the decision making body or the law making body, the more recognizing body, whatever term you think is most appropriate, uh, has then some sort of claim over the property within that area, which wouldn't be a particularly right libertarian position. So I think that would be the I think the the, the right libertarian way of looking at it. So I guess the right libertarian position would be something like uh, monarchy or private dictatorship, which, again, is fair enough. In principle, effective socialism ends up being sort of, you know, this is Orwell's theory of oligarchical socialism. In principle, effective socialism ends up being oligarchical, too. Now you could argue whether how effective it is. Um, it's not really, you know, this is the sort of general critique against democracy. Democracy doesn't work. It, it, you can't really make decisions a universal way um and this is why i think borders are actually in, in a way a humane having comp- different societies is actually a humane thing because as you state as long as one society is willing to let you in you're you you have a much better position here exile in a society exile means exile means more or less de facto death in a, death or sent to some sort of you know work camp if you sort of adopt this sort of universalist um, um, this sort of universalist position here. Um, um, so it, it's very, it's it's very, it's very tr- tricky here. Um, um, it's very tricky here. The home setting, of course, has problems when you get away from the initial thing, you get more industrialized here. Um, but the markets themselves have a sort of home setting built in. You know, why do the workers own the, uh, why should the workers own the means of production here? That's just sort of stated there. They oftentimes bring this up. This this is actually why Adam Smith and you know these sort of classical economists were sort of Adam Smith and Ricardo were all sort of closeted Marxists because they sort of believed in borderline labor theory of value. Whether that's true or not is just some question here. But there's no real reason why just because you happen to work at an Amazon warehouse, you own the uh, the you own the Amazon factory here. I mean, Walter Block brought up the point here. If if it's wherever, if it's wherever, if if natives owned wherever they could walk, well, then why couldn't Christopher Columbus also own wherever he walked? Um, it doesn't really solve the cue. It's a good like passive aggressive retort uh, argument, but logically and philosophically, it doesn't seem to answer anything. So now we have two competing people. Two people walked and sort of saw well wherever this you know, Chief St. Joseph could see was his land. Well, I mean, th- these are sort of like ad hoc things. Um, now, again, it could be that all borders are just ad hoc and there's no coherent theory. But that means for the critic, there's also no coherent theory either in a way. Um, um, you know, you're not, you're only marginally open borders. And of course, if you if you believe in any sort of property, you know, way of already stored borders here. Um, and if you took anarchism seriously here, pr- pr- property anarchism seriously, and you can force you say property anarchism is itself a contradiction. Um, um, but no left anarchist would, would say that, like, you know, you know, they, 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 they left, they will say, well, we believe in personal property. Well, th- this is, this is where it's either, this is, this is where it gets, it's either an annoying semantic dispute. So where does your personal property begin 
and public property begins or commons begins. Well, that's not clear. And we have and w- with the coronavirus crisis here, um, which, again, I want it to happen. Um, it, everyone's just basically acted like and in the more extreme sites like Australia, the sort of extreme solutions have come true. We've seen vaccine passports, home quarantine and so forth. So so, you know, you can't you can't leave your living room in a way. Um, or else you're a medical terrorist and it's for the common good. Um, so so I, I, I really say this is a tricky issue. There's a lot of good passive regrets, good torts that people will make against certain positions. But I've yet to see a coherent theory uh, come out of the situation here. And again, I think the closest theory remains that. Uh, what do you make of the owners? What do you make of the workers owning the means of production claim, which is sort of a classical Marxist claim. I've always thought that was sort of borderline libertarian here. And people like Mises would say that's, you know, syndicalism is not really opposed to capitalism. It's just workers' capitalism. Um, um, so, you know, there's nothing really wrong with sort of trade unions. The only conflict would be here if the if the if if some group would uh, um, and trade unions have their own problems here too with respect to open borders here. Interestingly enough, too. As I stated in the first episode, you know, trade unions, new workers are could be scabs um, to break up the trade union. So the so I guess the, the problem with trade unions are if they took it from someone else, you know, if they had a railroad, someone else built the railroad or someone else built this, you know, you know, cobbler shop or whatever, you could say small thing. Um, y- y- you have those problems. And it's, it's, what about the consumers of the goods? Those are also a problem there, too. You know, what if someone says. You know, we can provide education or trucking for a lot cheaper than you do. Well, you know, so, so what sort of what do you make of the owning? Because see, see, I view I view sort of classical Marxism um, having a sort of flaw deep inside of it here with respect to workers owning the means of production here. You know, that to me is a homesteading claim. Would you agree it's a homesteading claim? And how would you work that out? And what do you make of my comments on that, Swithin? It might not be a homesteading claim, but it's definitely a property claim. Um, So, yeah, I mean, should the workers own the means of production? Well, maybe. I mean, interestingly, uh, Hans Hopper um, argues that in communist societies, the people with the best claim on the um, the sort of uh, the means of production where in fact the workers in that case, I, I, I think he, I, I could be misremembering this, but he basically advocates for syndicalism in that scenario because, well, there's no sort of because his typical one is, well, you know, the taxpayers have been expropriated, you know, you get back to the taxpayers, etc. But they don't really have that in the communist system because well, everyone works for the state. And so he said, well, you know, the people who have the best claim to the to the uh, resources were uh, were the workers. Um, I suppose you could claim that, well, the reason the workers should have no, outside the sort of uh, desocialization sort of position Hopper was uh, mentioning, you could make the claim that the workers have the rights to it. Well, because, you know, that they have the best claim because, well, resources are there to be used. And so the people who are using them, well, your phone. Uh, Swithin, you're your breaking. Computer. I'm sorry to interrupt here, but you're breaking up. Um, if you could repeat that point. I don't know if it's on my end or your end. If you could repeat um, that. Point. Yes. Um, which, from which point? I know it's an awkward point to interrupt, but it's getting to the point where I, I'm missing multiple words here. Use space. You basically end up with a use space property system, which is that's something. That was oh, the last right, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you essentially get to a use-based system where whoever uses it is theirs. Um, and this is where, with the um, property, um, with with personal property, you know, you, you could say, well, because you use it all the time, it's kind of yours, and the extent to which you don't use it is the extent to which, well, it's just open for general use. Although it would be interesting to see whether or not the Marxist or the, the left anarchist, as it were, would be would mind if you turned up to your house and sort of like just use your house for a bit when they knew you were out because well you're not really using it then so you know it's not really interfering um with your use and so it should be fine so that's i think really what it it, 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 it that sort of comes down to although you could though say it's not necessarily a property 
uh, acquisition theory. It's more of a case of a of a general moral theory, which is, deals with with kind of property. Because um, when you get to the property things with, say, like homesteading or whatever, it's like, well, do you have complete and unconditional use of the property? Well, the Rothbardians would say no. Insofar as I can't use my property to beat you over the head. And so, well, so there's there's, there's a border there uh, of, of what sort of a just property use is. Um, so, yes, yeah, you, I think it's fair to consider it in a property, um, in property to some extent. Although you could, though, make the claim that property is just a, a rule of behaviour in a particular circumscribed domain rather than being anything categorically different from a general moral theory um but on to the but to go back to the original thing on um workers and workers capitalism there's nothing in principle problematic by that workers are the means of production you know worker democracy why not fine if you want to do that fine it's just a, it's just whether or not it's justifiable to make sure that everybody has a workplace democracy. Uh, that seems to be the, um, I think, the, the bone of contention that, say, Mises would have and others with that sort of proposal. I think this is related because if you imagine, if you remove the state, if you remove the state, and people are like, what, is, what, what does workers' capitalism have to do with borders? If you remove the state, um, those would be the, you know, that would be the social organization that would, you know, possibly fill the role of the state. So if you imagine the state is a shopping cart of goods um, today and increasingly more things are added to that shopping cart, you want to debundle it. Well, maybe maybe one of the roles could be taken by, you know, workers capitalism. This is sort of a way to make it more sympathetic to, um, um, you know, people with left wing sympathies in a way. But I'm not really sure if they have left wing sympathies all they, they might posture that way but it's not really clear that the sort of liberal you know you know everyone left from the epilepsy you know it's not really sure that they would actually like workers capitalism like and Thaddeus Russell always has a great critique of workers capitalism here or workers socialism whatever cynicalism in the sense that it requires a lot of work workplace democracy you know there is a benefit to alienation here insofar as you know the employer has um um, like interestingly, this turns up in the airline industry. Like, you know, if 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 you're in a if you're in a flight crew, if you from my understanding, if you're one of the junior officers and you make a mistake, your superior will be held responsible, but you won't be held responsible. So so in a system that's somewhat just, the higher you go up in the bureaucracy, in theory you you get more prestige, but you also get more uh, responsibility though in theory too, at least in a somewhat just you know, bureaucracy, at least in theory, um, or at least it ought to be that way, or maybe it ought not to be that way. So like, you know, wh when when people set the safety standards for a factory or say, you know, you have to make a de decision here. You know, of course, as Walter Block would say with Sam Cedar, you know, perfect safety is impossible. You know, there's some jobs that don't have perfect safety. You know, I don't know, cleaning sewers or setting up, um, you know, again, you know, if you want to have sewers, you got to have lead in your pipes. This goes back to eye pencils. So you're going to need these minerals, so you're going to need mines. So mining for minerals, and this is where we get these mining for minerals and these things is dangerous. So so if you have a so some workers are saying I'm willing to get paid more if I want to go down in the mine. So I should, but I'll take more risk. Now I agree with Chomsky. These people should get paid more than your college professor who sits in an office in an air-conditioned office. I agree. I, I, all the money at Harvard should be sent to coal miners or natural gas miners. I'd be, I'd be on the street. Uh, I'd, I'd fully support that motion um, as well. <laughs> all the money from BBC and NPR should go um, to people doing – I fully support that motion here. Um, um, but uh, uh, the reason why this relates to the discussion of borders here, again – is that you need an organization to fill the role of the state if you think the state has legitimate functions or certain aspects of the state has legitimate functions in an anarchist society. Again, we're going towards a more just, a, towards a better society here. Um, um, 
and the thing about unions, which are interesting here, is that unions historically had a dodgy view of immigration here, to say the least, especially with respect to Brian Kaplan here. To circle back to my first comment about you know, famously Bernie Sanders had the Freudian slips calling it Koch brothers conspiracy here. You know, uh, you know, one of the reasons in the in the North, for example, that many Irish were against um, slaves and, and and stuff coming north and so forth against the emancipation was that they would take their jobs. And this is, goes back to the minimum wage point here. It's never very politically incorrect uh, history of certain aspects here. Um, so traditionally, unions, ironically enough, played the role of being anti-immigration. <laughs> so like people like Ben Burgess and Sam Cedar will support unions. Um, but, you know, if you just logically think about things and you sort of think more and you just look at history in the past. Yeah. You know, and unions had a lot of mafia ties. There's Thaddeus Russell profiles. There's a, a labor's union that was supposedly assassinated or something like that. I forget his name. Jo uh, Hoffa, I think, was his name. Um, um, so what do you make of that, Swithin? You know, do you think they are related? I think they're clearly related because it's sort of – you imagine a less stateless society or times where there wasn't the modern material state. What played the role? Oh, that, of course, played the role. And you saw this in, like, medieval Europe with trade trade unions or, you know, uh, you know, co-ops of people like that, uh, you know, the, the cobblers and societies and so forth. What do you make of that, Swithin? And what do you make of the irony that the um, – you know, the Ben Burgess, Richard Wolfers, those types, they, they, they on one hand posture about open borders, but then support trade unions. If you look at the history of trade unions and that, that that's in that current and fair articles I read that you liked and I liked, um, which is very interesting about detailing the history there. It brought up a number of other points, but that was one of the points it was brought up. So I think what do you make of that? It's certainly the case. Uh, the extent to which the central state has less power, you're going to have organizations which are going to have some sort of ordering function. Uh, and so where the state doesn't mandate, um, you know, safety, health and safety in the workplace, then it's going to be need to be dealt with um, at, a, at a lower level. And it could well be the case that um, workers of a particular line of work want to band it together and go, well, actually, we think we would only really like to work in a, a place that has you know, this level of safety and, you know, we're not going to work with somebody who doesn't. And so I think your point about medieval Europe is an interesting one. My history isn't great, so I, 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 I don't want to pontificate 100 percent on that. But it, it, would, it does make entire sense. I mean, if you just look historically, uh, you know, local churches had more influence. Um, I mean, people talk so, a really sort of normally libertarian um, uh, Russ Roberts, for example, will, will talk about civil society and sort of like you know, civil society is kind of like being um, re, uh, its its influence is being reduced um, and basically being taken over by the state. And I think this is you know obviously true. Uh, you're going to need some sort of ordering um, function is going to get lower and lower. Uh, on a lower and lower uh, level as, you know, if you decentralize it. And that's not the case. So back on trade unions, yeah, it certainly is the case that trade unions historically were against immigration. And this was a traditional leftist argument. I do remember it being amusing that I was blocked. I was unfriended by somebody on Facebook once because he was going on about open borders. And I was going, well, you know, the traditional leftist position was against open borders for this economic reasons, at which point he unfriended me and blocked me which I thought was uh, somewhat amusing. And yes, you're exactly right. Um, uh, the trade unions, you know, weren't, um, hmm, how should we say, uh, up to the minute when it comes to things like race, to put it mildly. Um, and although, the, although what say the, well, I suppose the Ben Burgess types would say, well, you know, the trade unions were a progressive bunch but, you know, they were products of the time and they weren't really progressive on race and the sexual revolution. But now they're kind of we're kind of on board with that. And so, you know, it, it, it's OK. You know, we get the labor unions and they, they're just a bit wrong there, you know, about that, even though it's really an economic argument rather than like uh, a cultural argument to a large extent. Um, 
That said, though, when it comes to the trade unions in England, at least, the trade unions these days are very different from the ones they were historically. Um, prior to, say, the 1980s, they were very much sort of like uh, worker run. That is, you, you worked through the shop floor, you were sending in the hierarchy of the um, of the union like a leader of it but you were somebody who had lots of experience in sort of like the uh, heavy industries and factories and stuff and you know it'd be a very much a worker centric um organization since the 1980s they've been the, the higher position has been filmed by university graduates uh who have had significantly less to do with sort of like the uh, on, on the ground worker although that could be a function to some extent that the most unionized, ironically, the most unionized section in England now is the public sector, because, you know, we need the unions to protect ourselves from the government. What? No. Where, where, where's the evil capitalist we're supposed to be protecting ourselves from? But no, no, it, it, it's it's in. Um, I, well, the medical. As, with an, as Keith Preston said in his debate with Ben Burgess, oh. as Keith Preston said with the debate with Ben Burgess, he said the most, un, you know, describing a, a Non-profit organization with high, with almost 100% unionization rates and high pay. Oh, you're describing the American police force. Um, I, I mean, that, that's entirely true. You're also describing the American uh, postal workers, American um, um, uh, teachers, things like that. I'm not sure the precise case of Britain here, but you know, the public sector this is an organization that probably is very well protected. And who are they protecting themselves against? The public. Like, 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 are they defecting, you know, in a way, in a way, they're a new exploitation class, um, a unionized, uh, you know, a prison guard union here. And there are, you know, those, there are unions there. So keep, keep. Um, so um, the unions, as I say, today are, 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 are very different. And so they don't really look out for the e- in a sense, the, the the unions of the working class don't really exist. It's sort of like the white collar class have sort of unions of sorts, or they might call them professional associations. They're basically unions. Um, so 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 they have changed because I think really, if you do look at like the traditional sort of working class uh, and um, you know their interests, you know, they aren't. They're actually more towards the traditional sort of labour union that you'd have sort of like in the pre 1960s position. Which certainly isn't progressive on either. The, well, maybe progressive in the sexual revolution, not in, but certainly not to the same extent as the upper middle class are. But certainly not as um, progressive on race. I mean, which is obviously true. Um, I mean, so for example, in the in England, um, lots of the, the Brexiteers in like the northern or working class areas are basically still racist. Uh, that that that's kind of a narrative. Uh, but yeah, um, trade unions. The logic is this: I mean, trade unions uh, function by restricting the labour supply. That's how they can negotiate their positions. So why let in more people who are not part of the labour union? Because that just reduces the bargaining power of the trade union, which makes no sense. Um, so, yeah, uh, if you're really a big pro union type, you really at least shouldn't be completely Brian Kaplan uh, when it comes to immigration. I think that is clearly true. Although alternatively, um, and this, this goes back to point one, the sort of immigration, immigration borders position before the COVID hypocrisy nonsense happened uh, was a very divisive issue within the libertarian movement here. And I always thought the, and again, I think the Hoppians take a very clear position, much more, much more clear and much less emotive um, um, and a lot of special pleading. Certain ethnic groups are allowed to do certain things. And certain other ethnic groups aren't allowed to do certain things. So you have people like Bill Crystal um, supporting Hispanic immigration in the United States. But if anyone takes a trip through Florida or Texas, you know, and this is Ann Coulter's point, ironically, um, what are they doing? They're doing, they're doing, I mean, which is fine in a sense. They're doing dirty jobs at lower pay, oftentimes at pay that's, and this is again brought up by the current Ferris article that. Uh, they're they're taking wages much lower than the whites um, for a variety of reasons, um, and it's quite obvious that they're 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 destroying. Um, now maybe those jobs wouldn't be done um, in a state like Alabama. Vice, the old Vice, did a did an episode on 
um, there. You know, the, the one of the things that they did was just send the uh, prison population back out into the fields. Um, so, you know, this is the, the Walter Block question they got in trouble with the New York Times. Who would pick the cotton? Who would pick the watermelon and cantaloupe? Well, they it banned the Hispanics, so they brought in um, um, the prison population. They eventually brought allowed the Hispanics back in. Um, but it's an, it's an interesting question here. Uh, and 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 it it's it again it takes away a lot of the um the sort of highfalutin Mickey so to speak that a lot of open borders types. I guess I like the I'm when people like Brian Kaplan defend open borders he does it in a very honest and upfront way for honestly stated reason here. The problem is everyone else like the Burgesses the Cedars and and you know the Chomskys. They get into much more. They they tie knots and they're very schizophrenic here. Um, they tie knots and very schizophrenic here, and they don't. Sometimes things are okay, other times things aren't okay. Um, um, the Hoppians, you, you do point out a few problems. You know, like cer- certain persons that cannot be named support the European Union. Um, certain boogeymen um, support the European Union, which. Which again, so then why why do you know liberals support the European Union then? It's not an international organization; it's a regional organization, um, made predominantly one group. Um, interestingly enough, now I'm 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 neither for nor against it. I'd probably be against it here. Uh, uh, you know, it sort of homo- it sort of just in a way Americanizes Europe. Uh, and, and again, as Eric Coffin makes, the only way you can have local the only way the only way to be a cosmopolitan is you have to have local groups to take from. Um, um, and this this is where, you know, a lot of people talk about this destruction of indigenous cultures here. Um, then then why do you support globalism here? Now, it's quite clear that people like Brian Kaplan and to a large extent Jeffrey Tucker do. But everyone else, it's it's now a, good, a question you could ask us is why are we libertarians? And that's a good question. Um, that's a good question. I mean, in some ways, I'm politically homeless insofar as if I if I have a position that's close enough, people are interested in talking about things without, you know, blocking you as your your, your friend quickly did. If you bring up a, un, you know, an issue that's not, you know, that doesn't meet the, as Tom would say, the allowable index card of opinions, they get they they, they streak. Um, um, and, he, and he, you know, again, and even and for all. And it's more probably people like Ben Burge will debate them, but they they do get in these snaky, spidery, like slimy positions where it's like, what are you supporting here? Are you just supporting Mugran? I mean, I can imagine that, but can I spend, you know, a million Afghans to Mugran, and then they'll say they they want jobs at sixty thousand dollars a euros a year. If you don't provide them, you're, you're out. I mean. They say, well, that's a weird hypothetical, but that's in a way the hypothetical that this gets presented here. Um, and then as far as the war points, I'm going to restate that point. Without borders, a lot of non-interventionist arguments make no sense. And if anything, the interventionist arguments become the default position. And actually, historically, the progressives like John Dewey um, and LBJ, LBJ wanted to construct a new deal for Vietnam. You know, again, it's a... Like this is this is you, know, you want to invade Vietnam to set up a new deal. Um, um, so the borders don't the borders of America are, you know, the borders of Vietnam. they Vietnam should be part of the United States, more or less. And you take sort of Keith Preston's view of the United States. I think that's actually somewhat coherent. You have NATO plus CETO, America, Japan, South Korea, Vietnam exited. It. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think borders are necessary to protect you know, difference, difference here. So you don't have monoculture. You have individual uh, groups here, but internally you need you need some sort of protection here, or else it's just many here. But even the many end, ends up being just various differences here. So 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 in a way that's 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 an optimistic point here. Uh, I, I'm sorry to wrap this up. So then, do you have any further comments here on it? Do you, I mean, do you agree with the incoherence point um, for most opponents here? At least right libertarians are willing to discuss the issue and not be particularly slimy about it because as you brought up with personal property if i leave my house and then you know a group of of um people come in and squat there and they say they start up a they start filming a movie in the basement now do they own it because they um 
that they run the house. And again, you can imagine on a country level, you imagine on a much more larger level, you have like a, a million people come in and do the same thing. I mean, we have examples of that. We have, you know, the Puritans coming to North America, setting up a very wealthy, prosperous community, um, giving them horses and iron tools, and they hate them. They view them as uh, genocidal maniacs, um, uh, genociding maniacs. So I, I, the incoherence irritates me. Um, um, um. So, so with any any further comments or additional points to make or agreements or disagreements? I think the reason the right libertarians are um, more coherent in discussing borders is because they genuinely believe in property borders. And uh, so you got the hop here, you know, the whole world will be privately owned. You know, all, all property would be privately owned, which is the basis of your sort of immigration theory. You need the consent of the property owner to travel over it. There's no sort of consent of sort of um, there's no sort of concept of uh like common land or anything like that you know it's, it's, all, it's all private so i think that's one reason why they can discuss things coherent because they do recognize borders even if it is you could argue particularly they say a, a misesian position of well you know just deracinated abstract individuals who haven't own property but at least they're you know i'm a deracinated individual who is not you and i have some property and you some property and you know we have we have a border um and i think that's why the left what libertarians get fuzzier on it because their conceptions of property are significant well are fuzzier and the extent to which they're fuzzier means that they especially that they're fuzzy and the fact that in general in society we don't really allow to conceive of a uh, distinction amongst people groups in a clear way uh, that's very much verboten uh except when it is is mandatory as i've mentioned before you know, you know the south america are stupid for instance oh the bible belt is just like oh crazy fundies and they're all you know mental um but but in general with, with these more immigration war situations it's like oh no 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 we can't really make any difference between the afghans and us because you know we're all just people um and so i i the right libertarians have a way into the discussion which doesn't immediately strike people as oh no you're just a bunch of racists Although that eventually ends up being thrown at the right libertarians. Um, but it, it's the fact that they recognize property borders. Uh, S- Spencer, alt right figures, well, then they'll see borders in sort of ethnic and uh, racial groups. And then, of course, borders make sense there. Um, but uh, I, I, I think that because the rest of the culture doesn't, to a large extent, recognize clear distinction between peoples and whatever, have take a very liberal view. They just can't really have a coherent conception of borders at all. And it's very, very sort of ad hoc. Um, only if you have a clear concept of property or sort of like ethnic and racial dispute uh, differences. Um, and, 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 and also possibly, you know, recognize difference in different parts, like different sort of regional cultures within a particular even nation state. Uh, if you recognize those, you can have a get towards like a, a broad, coherent idea on borders. But otherwise, if you take a, a consistent liberal position, you, you can't and you, you end up just being um, uh, arbitrary. That would be my sort of concluding uh, remarks. You, you got anything else to add, Tim? Yeah, uh, the, the, the only thing else I'll say is I don't want people like Glenn Greenwald to go around and become like Christopher Hitchens. Um, but I, I, you know. There, there is a question of like why couldn't you engineer a republic over there? Um, and, and the historical progressives, and this goes back to the pragmatic claim we made in the first episode. The historical progressives were very, you know, people like do uh, John Stuart Mill, for example, thought that strong countries like Britain should invade and raise and better everybody. Um, their borders don't end there. Um, um, so, so the historical progressive movement. Which which held state power. It, it is true that actual Marxists never really held actual power in the United States with a capital M. But the historical progressives who lean on them and their cultural energies and movements all the time clearly did. Uh, clearly did have interventionist aims um, um, in broad. So I don't want them to go out and say, well, because we don't believe in differences of people, we should go there. But I I really it, it's a really interesting question of like on the um, 
invasion point there. You know, why shouldn't we go invade them? It, it's if you could end. Why can't we go engineer? It, would, it, should, it, it should be mandatory almost. Interestingly, um, um, again, I don't want to turn around and say they do. I think for pragmatic reasons, you can make the case against it. Um, but the pragmatic case is at least more honest here. Um, so that, those are my concluding marks. Um, you might say that it was sort of disparate and incoherent, and that the, our, our case we made was uh, uh, somewhat hackneyed. But um, I, I think that's the best we can do. You know, some kind of borders, everyone agrees with them. And the people that don't also don't think that others can't erect them. So that's, that's point one about physical removal. And point number two is you can actually protect um, indigenous people, but that includes no special pleading for certain indigenous groups here either. So overall, I think that was a very interesting discussion here, Swithin, and thanks for doing it. Thank you, Tim. And now I'd just like to thank everyone for listening. If you've enjoyed this, please share it with your friends and family and or anyone you think might find it of interest. And uh, subscribe to us on uh, Podbean and on YouTube. The more subscribers we get, the higher we get in the search rankings. And finally, if you'd want to contact the show for any reason, please contact us at MindsCrimeLibertyShow at gmail.com. That's MindsCrimeLibertyShow at gmail.com. Contact the show for any reason, please contact us at MindsCrimeLibertyShow at gmail.com. That's MindsCrimeLibertyShow at gmail.com. Thank you.